Human ingenuity can be truly amazing. We grow a lot of almonds in California, so to make harvesting them easier, a machine was invented to shake the nuts from the tree. But these trees need this concrete ditch to grow. This cotton needs this concrete canal to grow. In fact, on the west side and the southern end of the Central Valley, virtually everything depends on this twisting delivery system to grow anything. The Central Valley doesn't get a whole lot of this. So snowmelt from the northern and eastern mountains is stored and conveyed by the massive engineering projects built by both the state and federal governments during the last century. Our ability to move water around is a testament to our cleverness, as well as a statement about our arrogance. We have created a system that delivers water to grow crops on land that would never be productive naturally. Moving all that water around seemed like a good idea at the time. Millions of acres would have remained a barren waste if the men who settled this part of the Great Valley had not used their knowledge and strength to irrigate the land. Farmers in the Central Valley had been making their arid land productive by digging wells. The Central Valley Project would capture snowmelt from the Living Rivers and dole it out in summer through a 3,000-mile grid of dams, canals, and reservoirs. So when the U.S. government decided to build the Central Valley Project to bring water to the valley, it was seen as both an exciting engineering project and a New Deal program to get people back to work. Then, California, under Governor Pat Brown, the current governor's father, built the state water project. The presidential helicopter stirs up clouds of dust as it lands in Los Banos, California. It's a pleasure for me to come out here and help blow up this valley. Agriculture was delighted, but fooling with Mother Nature created unintended consequences still costing us today. By the late 60s, federal and state waterworks had lifted the rivers out of their ancient beds and delivered them to every corner of the Great Dry Valley. Diverted and dammed rivers meant trouble for salmon, forcing many runs to the edge of extinction. For example, this dam blocks the once mighty San Joaquin River. I'm not a genius or anything, I'm just a farmer, but common sense tells me the reason we have such a decline in the salmon, they've dried up all the rivers. And salmon have to have fresh water to spawn. And if they have, if this, like this river here, has been dry for 60 years. Can you imagine the amount of salmon that have been lost in 60 years? The San Joaquin River below Friant Dam was dewatered. The salmon runs in the San Joaquin River used to sport a very significant salmon run. Certainly there were no way that fish could make it over this very, very significant dam. But even if they could, fish can't walk up a dry riverbed. So it was very, very clear that this dam would wipe out the salmon run. And the decision was made to sacrifice that salmon run. Say, kids, what time is that? While the first generation of TV kids were enthralled by Howdy Doody, the grown-ups in charge decided to try and fix some of the damage caused by the demand for water. Hatcheries had been around a long time, but they would begin to become a critical part of mitigating the damage done to salmon. In fact, many argue that without hatcheries, salmon would be gone. You're looking at a baby factory. This is the government's Coleman Hatchery. In each of these drawers are freshly hatched baby salmon. They start their life here. When they get big enough to survive on their own, their life changes. This is the Livingston Stone Winter Run Hatchery at the base of the Shasta Dam. 
these winter run smolts are scooped up. Dumped in a truck. And the truck is backed down the Reading boat ramp. There, they are pushed through a hose into the river to begin a journey that, if successful, will take them under the Golden Gate Bridge and out into the wilds of the Pacific Ocean. Hatcheries aren't perfect. Better decisions need to be made about when and where the trucks release the babies. Some are trucked to the bay and held in netted pens to acclimate to the saltier water before being released to start their swim to the ocean. And so the fish actually is acclimated to, to the salt water. Fish are able to swim to the bottom and they don't have as much uh, um, problems with, with predators uh, such as birds and stripers. Others, as you've just seen, are dumped into the river and far too many of those either die in the delta from urban and agricultural pollutants in the water or they're eaten by hungry fish or bird predators. Or worse, they become victims of our water delivery system. They die from being carried to the dreaded ops. Imagine yourself a salmon coming up into the system, or, coming, or juvenile salmon coming down the Sacramento River, you're, suddenly you find yourself in the delta where there's no clear signal of which way you should go. You get confused, you wind up in the central delta, which is a pretty hostile environment to, to fish like that, um, and you die. This is a section of the delta. The delta is an estuary, a mixing zone where fresh water meets salt water. Many fish species depend on a healthy delta salmon being the most important both culturally and economically. The delta is like a highway for Northern California water. This is the federal government's water pumping station. There is another similar to this one run by the state. This is at the center of debate that is California water politics. The water for agriculture is pumped south by these giant electric pumps. Now, if you're a fish going through these pumps, you just came to the end of your life as you're ground up and spit out. In the middle of the state, another attempt to undo the damage caused by moving water took shape in the 50s. Someone came up with the idea of screening delta water before it gets to the pumps, the death path of suckage. The answer was the Tracy Fish Collection Facility. This one is operated by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Here, the river is channeled away from the pumps. Brett Baker is a pear farmer in the Delta. We first met Brett at his farm next to a tributary of the Sacramento River. That's what all the fuss is about. Brett knows a lot about pears and a lot about the Delta. Got a good history here. The climate is just perfectly suited for growing pears, and we've been doing that here for over 150 years now. And uh, we've got big, goofy dogs that grow well here, too. Brent is also a fisherman and a fish biologist with a degree from the University of California, Davis. 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. fish count. Um, saw the process to use to separate fish from water here, try and get an accurate. Uh, figure for uh, how many fish come through this, this facility. They're trying to gain a better understanding of how efficient their screening uh, mechanism is and what percentage of these fish are actually diverted in this collection facility as opposed to being ground up in the pumps two miles downstream. Fish are pulled into large vats, identified and evaluated. Then they're logged and put back in a pail. Then they're dumped into special trucks and driven to a place where they can resume their lives without being sucked into the pumps. That is, if they can make it after all of that. Maybe in the 50s this was a good idea. I can't imagine that folks would say this is our best effort at, at trying to preserve these fish. 
to effectively minimize your impacts on a, on a system like the Delta while extracting water. There's really no, no way of knowing how many fish make it past this facility and, and wind up in the pump. This is not the best available science. This is pretty horrendous, and this is the best we can do to, to save fish. These fish that end up in the facility only represent a small portion of the fish that are impacted by the pumps. What we're seeing here is the tip of the iceberg when, you, when you're looking at the impacts that these pumps have on, on these fish. As a society, we want to preserve these, these species for their intrinsic value, their economic value, the biological processes that they provide. Definitely is an indication of quality of our water and the ecosystems that rely on that water. I don't, I don't think that drinking water that fish can't live in is a, is a good idea. If, if these fish species aren't able to maintain populations, healthy populations, in the delta, maybe our, our water quality and millions of people's drinking water may not be fit for, for use. There's a reason that, that we chose to bond, bind ourselves to the ideals encompassed in the Endangered Species Act. We should uphold those ideals. The methods to mitigate the impact of human activities on our salmon runs, while necessary, are far from perfect. In many ways, we are still stuck with the science of the 1950s. And while the struggle over water has always been contentious, these days, the voices are louder. Because of the Endangered Species Act that basically involves nearly every fish on planet Earth. The science is subject to political interpretation and legal challenges. We intend to file another lawsuit. What we do know is that we have to do a better job with the babies and the fish screening at the pumps. We also need to do a better job of getting the message into the heads of our political leaders that humans created the problem that salmon have and humans can fix it. Share this video with your friends, family, and coworkers. And send it off to your elected representative too. Let them know that it's time to do the right thing that it's time to make more water, salmon water, now.